Uh, becoming a member is very important. Uh, first of all, you get to learn a lot of uh, new trends, what's going on in the industry, and in the meantime, you also get to network and meet a lot of people. I found the MECSE platform incredibly beneficial for networking and meeting people and like-minded people within the industry. MECSC uh, gives an opportunity to explore but also uh, to get new insights on the market development so we could work preventively on what and how to expect the changes in the market and the retail and the mall uh, fields. Well, MECSC gives you a wide uh, audience to reach out with your product or service. Uh, because it gets you access to high professional development and authorities. Experience, community, family and good damage. For people like us, you know, it's a right forum where we can connect to the, the retailers which we needed. Middle East Council gives you a lot of uh, uh, access, access to resources and information. Becoming a member leads you to different opportunities. Knowing other people from the industry, it allows you to be a link to other uh, retailers, shopping centers, which you can gain experience. It also gives you a chance to share your ideas, get the new ideas, and also the new trends within the industry.
Well, thank you everyone for joining us today on this masterclass webinar. It's been a while since we've had our last webinar and I'm so pleased today to be able to be back with you to talk about what we're doing, what's, what's going on in the industry, but most of all, the gentleman that we're about to share the screen with and to share his knowledge with is uh, no stranger to the Middle East Council of Shopping Centers and Retailers. I've known Michael for over six years. He's been uh, not only an instructor for our live events, but he's also been one of our great instructors on our digital platform that we've launched. So uh, he's been a great uh, supporter of our organization, but most importantly, he provides an insight that you don't get anywhere else. Uh, and so I'm very thrilled to have Michael with us. Michael, I know you're just not far away. Why don't you start by telling us a bit of your background and what we can expect from this webinar masterclass today. I know Sentio is a leader in the marketplace, so uh, the, the floor is yours. Perfect, Th thanks David. And yeah, it, it, I guess it is about six years. We and we were talking, it was a Spanish restaurant at the Kempinski in, in Dubai when we met. So that was, <laughs> it, it was a time when we could still get together in the physical world, which was nice. <laughs> Um, so I've, just to give a, a quick uh, intro to Centeo as a company, Centeo has been around for almost 16 years. In October, it'll be 16 years. We were one of the first to, let's say, dedicate ourselves to the topic of operationalizing customer experience, uh, creating new formats for relationship management with customers, and actually guiding change and transformation from product-centric business models to customer-centric and even relationship-centric business models. And for retailers and shopping centers, this is a, a territory that's uh, it's become a buzz topic, uh, but, but there's still a, a ton of room for development. Uh, as for me, I've been doing large-scale change transformation projects uh, for the last 26 years. I've worked in over 30 different countries. I speak three languages, and there, uh, there's a fourth that I speak poorly, but I can get by, and I can I can order a I can order food and a pizza in Czech. Uh, other than that, I speak fluently Spanish, Russian, and and English. Um, so that's a, a little bit. We as a company, we probably have about sixty percent of our work in uh, financial services, uh, but the rest of the work that we do is in retail, healthcare, telecom, uh, restaurant chains. Uh, everything. So we're, we're pretty good at taking the methodology pieces and applying them to different uh, different industries. And they, what we're talking about today is is the, the idea of customer journeys. And customer journeys has become also a buzz topic for the last uh, few years. Everybody's saying it. And a lot of people don't have a clear understanding of what it is, how to map, how to manage, how to measure performance in customer journeys and so on. So a little, little intro. <laughs> And uh, I think we chose the format today of just having a conversation, which I think is great. I, I think, you know, people have gotten so used to uh, just having slides on the screen in front of them. I, I think having just a conversation on the topic is really interesting. And if people want to learn, we have the online learning center uh, with, with very kind of uh, quality structured courses that people can learn from. So uh, thanks, Michael. What I'm looking at today, um, people are asking, what are we going to gain today? What are we, what are we doing? How, what are we doing here today? So you'll gain today practical insights of the differences between user experiences, user journey, user, easy for me to say, user journeys, customer experiences and customer journeys, and life experiences and life journeys. So these are all things that Michael and I are going to discuss today. So it'll be interesting for us to be able to go through and, and, and see how this all pans out. Michael, let me start with some kind of an idea to get going. Customer journeys these days, overrated. Tell me what it is. What's your first step when you're talking to your clients about customer journeys? So uh, a customer journey, if, if you just put it in Google and, and type in customer journeys, uh, there will be a thousand different definitions of what it means. Uh, it's basically taking a customer from to something. It's the, the, journey, the, the number of contacts and the progression of contacts between something that a client wants to get. If you look at it as a user journey, it might be how somebody... Uh, uses the functionality of, let's say, if we're talking about a shopping center, how somebody uses the parking lot, the parking garage, or how somebody gets to a bathroom 
or how somebody navigates to, you know, to find the right store that they're looking for and so on. Those would all be kind of user journeys where it's just about the effective format of using the fun functionality that's provided to get from to. Um, and, and there may be multiple contacts uh, along the way. Some of them might have a different emotional, let's say, scale. <laughs> you know, some of them might be frustrating. Some of them might be pleasing and so on. Uh, that's the, the most basic form of, of customer journeys, which is what we call a user journey. A true customer journey uh, is a lot more complex. Uh, so that's looking at it from the customer's point of view when the customer is trying to achieve something. Uh, so maybe it wasn't my goal just to get to the shopping center, use the bathroom and find the store. Maybe I'm trying to get ready for a wedding or my son's birthday party, or I'm trying to you know, buy the right business suit to get a new job. And there's much more involved in that customer journey than there is in just the user journey of parking the car, finding the bathroom, getting to the store, and, and so on. Uh, and then if you talk about life journeys, it's uh, it, in all of our lives, we're going to have some series of life events that we're going to go through. And if we have an ongoing relationship with customers, maybe we can help them to get through different life events. So I think I, I answered more than uh, more than the question, but it's it's a uh, it's truly a valuable topic for anybody who's trying to uh, have a decent relationship with their customer um, to understand these different types of journeys. And I think globally, there's a lot of noise around the topic right now. <laughs> Sorry. What I'm what I'm hearing from all of this, it, it makes sense to me, and, and appreciate it. What I what I need to know from being a retailer guy, tell me how we can quantify this and make it make sense in the journey of a retailer. Let's talk about uh, any retailer. Let's, let's just say Zara, for instance, because everybody knows Zara. So yeah. tell me about this customer journey with Zara that you're, you're referring. Okay. So there would be a, a simple user journey of how do I get to a Zara store, find what I want, try it on, buy it, leave with the bag, and so on. So I may have a, a series of contacts with people inside of the store from the meet and greet to the changing room, to the cashier, to saying goodbye to me as I'm leaving and so on. Uh, or that could be a multi-channel uh, experience and a multi-channel journey. Maybe I went into the store, tried something on, was a little bit unsure, but at least I know my size now. And then when I got home, I decided, you know, I really do want that. And so I ordered it online and it's delivered, you know, so that you can have this collection of different contacts through different channels as well, which makes it a little bit more difficult to manage the consistency and the emotional state of the customer as they're moving through these different contacts. That would be a really good example of a user journey. Now, if Zara had a, a solution for me, uh, let's say I'm a student and I just graduated and I need to uh, build a wardrobe for my first job. And let's say Zara put together a, a solution package of, you know, here's how you choose your wardrobe for your first job. You know, you're going to need this many shirts and this many ties and these shoes and these this suits and so on. And maybe they put it into some, you know, pricing different categories of, you know, I'm the I'm I'm a economical student moving into, or I just landed a job at McKinsey so I can spend some money, whatever. Um, if they actually put things into some type of more complex package. That would be a solution journey or a true customer journey, looking at a complex solution for, from the customer's point of view. Now, if Zara said, hey, listen, you're probably going to constantly be changing your wardrobe. Let's get you in some type of a subscription program where once a quarter, uh, you're going to get a new suit and two new shirts and two new ties and a pair of shoes and a belt and so on. They could actually have me on more of a life journey where I'm, I'm ongoing, I'm consistently adapting my wardrobe based on my relationship with, with, uh, with Zara. So that, that gives you three different types of journeys that can be managed and they, they, all of the technology exists. Uh, customers love the stuff. <laughs> it, we just need to get the retailers and the shopping centers to start thinking in this way. Um, we've been doing, for example, we've been doing this uh, like structured pricing and tariff plan programs in the banking industry for 20 years. Um, why we don't do it with retailers uh, sometimes is confusing to me. But we, give me we an example. Give me an example of that, Mike. Well, just what I just what I showed. So, it, uh, the funny story. So, we had a, 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 
a bunch of people that started in the company. This was two years ago when we were still in the physical world. And our office in Moscow uh, is above a shopping mall. It's in a high rise and there's a shopping mall downstairs. And we had four new people start. And I said, listen, let's do this. Everybody go down to the shopping mall, pick whatever store you can agree on, and we will design a relationship centric offering. And so they came back and they picked a, a Reebok uh, store. So we were like, okay, what do you have in there? You've got sport, sports, uh, like shoes, tennis shoes, whatever. You've got sporting clothing, whatever, whatever. And we said, okay, let's design a subscription model. Um, so you're probably going to change your gym clothes, you know, once a year, twice a year, or maybe you're a, a gym bunny and you, you need to have a different look for every quarter or every couple of months. So let's design a subscription program where you're choosing certain things and it goes into a monthly payment and every quarter you get new new things. We sat around and, and over the course of an hour and a half, we designed an entire kind of relationship centric uh, subscription model. Then if I look about a year and just over a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago, Nike launched a subscription model for uh, children's shoes. Um, and so basically for... 20, 30, or $50 a month, you get four, six, or 12 new pairs of shoes per year. And they just send them to you. And if you, you know, the problem is kids' feet grow. So, <laughs> so you, need, you need the replacements. And so you can either use them as hand-me-downs or you can give them back to Nike and Nike will rework the materials and produce other things with them or use them in charity programs and so on. So there's, there's a, 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 an interesting model. There's also, uh, there's also a model, um, I don't know if anybody's heard of massage envy in the, in the Middle East. In the US, there's a, a chain of, of stores. It probably wouldn't be good in the Middle East. <laughs> uh, in the US, there's a chain of stores where they do facial procedures and stretching and massages and, and things like that. And they have a subscription model where you pay a monthly fee and there's ah, a certain number okay. of things included. Yeah. So it's not the, the services, experiences, and transformations that we're talking about. You've mentioned the services. Let's talk about a service industry just for a second. How can we get a customer service business to be really focused on making that experience? And so, services, uh, we talk about bank. But let's talk about other services. I mean, like a gym, for instance. You mentioned gym with Reebok. What kind yeah. of a service uh, element with a gym makes their experience better? That's a, a beautiful, I'd, I'd like to start with one, one thing really, which is the, the, the difference between a service and an experience. And, and let's say quality of service and a quality of a customer experience. So okay. if, we, if we look at just customer service, customer service is mostly about how the organization fulfills its basic obligations, its basic contractual obligation to the customer. I give you this service, you're satisfied with that service, you're willing to pay for it, maybe you'll recommend me to others and be satisfied and whatever. That's the most basic form of fulfilling uh, expectations of the customer. Uh, a customer experience is about how we make things positive, unique, engaging, memorable. And so by nature, a good customer experience is about exceeding expectations. It's about creating an element of surprise or, or an element of, of uh, something unexpected because it went above and beyond uh, what I had as my base set of expectations. Now, if you think about a health club, um, a health club provides a service. For a membership fee, I get access to a room with a bunch of equipment and, and so on. Um, what are people actually seeking when they go to a health club is quite different. So I, I don't go to a health club because I love the equipment and the smell of the locker room or whatever. <laughs> I go to a health club because I'm trying to get rid of this extra 10 kilos that I got on me. And wouldn't it be great if that health club, and to take it back to uh, the journeys again, the user journey of how I gain access to the club, use my locker, use the equipment, take a shower, get dressed home, whatever, that's the user experience. The customer experience could be very outcomes driven. So what are you trying to achieve? I need to lose 10 kilos. They could design a whole journey of, okay, we're, we're gonna have you talk to a dietitian. We're gonna have you, we're gonna put, your trainer is gonna design this program for you. If you don't show up three times a week, we're gonna call you and say, hey, Michael, where are you? <laughs> you know, yeah. And they could actually guide the journey to achieving the goal, to achieving the desired outcome. 
Um, and they could even theme those. So maybe my goal is to lose 10 kilos. Maybe somebody else's goal is to get their body back in shape after childbirth. Uh, maybe Pilar is preparing for an Ironman competition. You know, yeah. everybody could have a different goal. And those solution packages are great as a, as a journey, helping a customer from to something that they're trying to achieve. So that transformation component becomes very interesting. Uh, what, what, am, what am I getting at the end of it? And unfortunately, okay. most, most health clubs just sell the membership, the service. Yeah, yeah, I understand. One of the things that I'm, uh, that explains it well, by the way, thanks. One of the things that I'm faced with uh, frequently these days is the marketing departments of shopping centers. And they, um, these marketing departments are looking for ways to incorporate a digital surprise element that's going to make a difference that people haven't already seen before, either on their phone or some other way. But it basically straddles both worlds. So you're capturing the digital world and the physical world with the actual shopping center. Yeah. Give me your thoughts on that or if you have any about how we can have a customer journey that's going to be a little more digitally focused. The opportunities there are almost endless. I mean, the way technology is developing now. I, I had a, 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 a conversation with a, a, a friend who worked at a company that makes all these navigation uh, kiosks and they're talking about how to make them more and more interactive and so on. And I thought, why, why do we even need those kiosks anymore? Everybody's got a phone. Uh, yes. Wh why can't I just, you know, choose where I need to go and my phone can guide me there? <laughs> like, turn right, turn left. Yes. And, you know, and, and but so, you, the GPS function on these phones is, not that uh, it enables that already anyway. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, and they could, well, they can do it with uh, GPS, but they can also do it with uh, Wi-Fi beacons, which, which yes. are a little bit more yeah. targeted and, and, yeah. and uh, accurate. And they could actually, you can actually through the camera, you know, you could, you could eliminate all navigational signage and just put your phone up and through the camera, see arrows of I'm supposed to go here and supposed to go there. So you could even get into this kind of augmented reality uh, type experience. And uh there's a lot of stuff being done now with virtual uh, changing rooms where you could try on stuff. Personally, I, I, I maybe I'm an old guy. I like the, I like. Well, the, I mean, uh, you and I shop once a year, whether we like it or not. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah. that's it, right? I like. I still like the experience of the store, and I think. Uh, I mean, there was an example that I gave last year. I think on the webinar that we did together this time last year. Uh, of, you know, if you took, for example, a, a normal Louis Vuitton uh, experience, they've, they've engineered it quite well so that your senses are engaged and you're encouraged to touch and the, the balance of what they do in terms of designing the, 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 the experience in the physical space versus the amount of merchandise that they've got on the floor, they're really creating a, a, an environment that's more about the experience and less about pushing the product. They have the margin to do that. Uh, yeah. where other stores yeah. might, might not. But then if you go to Louis Vuitton online, it's just a dry, dry experience. And so I think we're going to start getting into a lot more hybrid type experiences online as well, where maybe I'm starting an experience at home and maybe there's a, a virtual kind of consultant that I can talk to over video and maybe they're showing me things and, and maybe I don't even have to go to the store. Maybe they send me a courier with things to try on and they can bring me the, the split of champagne or the, the cappuccino that they pick up on the way. Who knows? <laughs> but I think in the center, I think there's still a lot to the physical. There's a lot thing. of expansion to go. Yeah. yeah. I, I believe that uh, your business could um, benefit largely by even focusing on the shopping center marketing teams on digital initiatives. Yeah. I have been asked, and even in the last week, I've had three separate shop, well, no, six separate shopping center groups ask me about what's leading edge these days, what's going on. And I think that that sounds like uh, an element of Sentia where they could really benefit uh, yeah. the, the customer. Well, here's, a, here's a great journey component to that. What if I am going to a shopping center because I need to buy more than one thing? Uh, right, <laughs> which uh, you know, it happens often, by the way. It happens. It happens. Yeah. <laughs> so, what if I'm going to a shopping center because we're going on vacation next week? Uh, okay, unlikely during the pandemic, but okay, let's say we're, we're going on a yeah. trip and I need to get a, a new bathing suit and sunscreen and uh, you know, something for the kids and beach toys. Who knows? 
what if they gave me through a shopping center app the ability to create checklists of what I need to buy? Uh, and then they could actually recommend and navigate me to the retailers that have those things. So, you know, at the shopping center level, they could be designing a, a journey to help me achieve a, a complex goal of, I got a whole checklist of things that I need to buy today. What is the most efficient route? Where do I want to stop and eat something? Because I'm probably going to be tired. How do I find a Starbucks in here? You know, kind of the, yeah. It, they yeah, yeah. really engineer this kind of way to guide customers through the journey. Tell me about, um, you mentioned in a discussion the other day, balance sheet centric journeys. Tell me. Yeah. So there's a, it's the, this is the, probably less about journeys and more about uh, business models themselves. So there, okay. there, are, there are kind of four different types of business models that we've identified in this evolution of business models. Balance sheet centric would be the most uh, simple kind of uh, asset and liability management type business, right? So you've, you've mm -hmm. got a store, you've, they're managing their product inventory. It's not very kind of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, engineered at all. Uh, let's say it would be more like a, a some type of bazaar or market or something like that, where the, the daily P&L and the daily income statement is the most important thing. Then you get to more product focused businesses where you have particular product lines and maybe we're designing complete, uh, let's say, accessories to a, a, a common product line. Then you get to customer-centric business models where it's more about uh, designing solutions for a particular need or goal for customers. And then you get to these relationship-centric uh, business models, which would be more subscription-based and, and so on. An easy way to think about this is um, think about how we bought music uh, 20 years ago. Uh, we were buying music in a very product centric format. It was a, a disc or a cassette or whatever, uh, a bundle uh, where we've, we've bundled different things together into a, into a collection and we're forced to buy the entire bundle, whether we only wanted one song or yeah, one all CD. Yeah. Very product centric. Uh, digital music happened, uh, which, which almost killed the music industry. And Apple came out with iTunes, which was uh, a, a, yeah. a quick savior for the music industry, but didn't save it altogether. iTunes, very customer centric. So I buy only the music that I want. I organize it into playlists the way that I want to listen to the music. I can put ratings and rankings and share it with others and get their playlists and listen to those and so on. Very customer centric. Um, but if we think about a relationship centric model, Apple Music is a subscription. And so yes, it it, is. it's really, so we're buying access to a library. Um, and we couldn't possibly listen to the whole library in our entire life. <laughs> and yet they want you to come back every day and download another. Find piece. something new. Yeah. And so that's kind of the difference between a product centric, customer centric, relationship centric. But to think about it economically, the music industry has only had growth, re revenue growth globally in the last five years. And that's largely due to streaming music. Um, and if we look at the difference between iTunes and Apple Music, the relationship centric model is really economically great for business because you have a customer on a subscription. The average monthly spend for iTunes users in the US was $3.50 per month. Apple Music costs $9.95 per month. It's the same, same library. Same thing. Just, same thing. We're just greedy consumers. Different labels. We, want, we want access to that whole library. Yeah. So. You want, well, you want it all. And that's yeah, generally yeah. what it is. Yeah. That's uh, so, there's a there's another subscription model in the U.S. that Cadillac uh, launched. So you, in big cities, they've created kind of an auto park of like a car park of all these Cadillac vehicles, and you pay a subscription fee of fifteen hundred dollars per month. I think everything's included: the insurance, the servicing. They'll even park it for you if you're going to be out of town, and you can change cars eighteen times per year. <laughs> <laughs> so you, literally if you have friends coming into town and you're like i want an escalade you know you yeah, take yeah. the escalade Big car. and then yeah. a week later you take a different car that's easier to park you know yeah 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 well that's a, that's great and that's very surface related so yeah. what are the things i like all your your background on your journey your customer journeys and the life journeys the other things you've talked about but can you tell our audience today about a practical uh, success story of a customer journey and a retail business? So they're all kind of linked together. 
Uh, you know, we, we do this a lot in, in retail banking um, and we, we've done it together with retailers. So for example, uh, a few years ago, we launched uh, like a home remodel package um, okay. and it, was, it kind of backfired on us because we did the project with a bank. <laughs> the, whole, the whole idea was to sell more loans. And we yes. said, you know, listen, if you just approach your customers all the time saying, hey, do you need money? It gets kind of boring. And so we yes. said, you know, let's create some themed solutions and then we can invite partners into it. So we said, okay, home remodels, you know, remodeling your apartment or your home, big deal, confusing for a lot of people. Most people have never done it before. So if we created a whole set of, let's say, educational videos and checklists and how-to guides and calculators and budget planners and things like that, that would help people through the process. And they might realize that they need a loan along the way and take and take a loan. Um, but then we started inviting partners into it, the big DIY retailers and, you know, Ikea and Leroy Merlin and these, these different kind of uh, retailers that are around the topic of that. And we put in um, uh, a network of uh, designers and architects and things like that to, if you need to replan your floor plan and get it approved and so on. And it turned into this whole solution package where the credit was just one piece of it. And where it backfired on us was we did it to have to sell more loans. But there were people coming saying, you know, we want the package. We don't need the loan, but we want the package. And we would put <laughs> <laughs> because the package had all these discounts in it and the tools were really <laughs> actually quite useful. And the, the whole idea was, you know, guiding to sell more money yeah. through this journey. And, and so we, we had put a price on it uh, of, I think, like the equivalent of $50 for this package of tools and discounts and everything. Um, and we said, you get it for free if you take the loan. Well, the people that were coming just for the package were willing to pay the $50. But because of the banking license rules in, in Russia, you can't sell products that are non-financial. So we uh, had this dilemma. So you're stuck. Of, yeah. You're so stuck. We, we ended up giving away the packages for free. But uh, yeah, well, worked out for the customer. That's a good customer. Yeah, yeah, it was question. actually a really good solution. And it still and it still did well for their customer relationships because they were seen as creating value for their customers. So it was fine. When I'm thinking of Sentio and I'm talking to you about uh, the marketing elements that you're so tuned into, uh, I've had requests for different shopping center groups. If, if I would know of anybody who does strategy sessions for customer journeys, and I've mentioned the name Sentio, but give me an idea of what you would do. Uh, if, if some shopping center group came to you and said, look, I want a strategy session to how to make this, yeah. uh, what would Sentio yeah, okay. offer? So there, there's a couple, a couple different things we do, and, and we do them in, in a couple different ways. So sometimes we just do the educational component. Uh, yeah. Sometimes we're hired to do more of the consulting side where we're going to do the work ourselves and come with a concrete yeah. uh, solution. The one that we like, the format that we like the most, um, and it's largely because these aren't one-time activities. Any shopping center, any retailer is going to have a continuous. No, need it's a strategy for, session, really, more than anything, isn't it? Well, yeah. well, no. It, it, so the, the format that we actually enjoy is education and guidance, where okay, where great. we're yeah. going and facilitating a session, and the session can be more than a session. It might be something over time. So if we took the hygiene side of, of uh, let's say, user journeys, making a user journey more uh, pleasing, engaging, uh, fulfilling, uh, whatever. If we took that side, typically we would train a team in the methodology, help them to map different user journeys, help them to prioritize uh, the, the, the changes or improvements to those user journeys, and maybe even provide some support during, uh, during implementation. And usually what they get coming out of that is kind of a, a, a list of things that we need to do today and, an, and a backlog of other things that could keep them busy for you know, a year uh, and so on. If we look at more of the customer journey, the solution side of things, um, this is more what we call experiential innovation. And it's using elements of emotional engagement, uh, customer experience and, and customer journeys to guide the customer to some solution, some desired outcome. And we call it innovation because really we're finding new ways to create value for the customer and it's creating new ways to monetize uh, that customer relationship for the retailer. 
Um, and then if we look at it from a, a more kind of relationship management standpoint, we could even start looking at subscription models and things like that. How do you get customers into a, a, a membership type uh, business? We did a restaurant chain years ago and they had a, a loyalty program, which was basically giving people uh, about 10% uh, cash back in loyalty points uh, that they could then use to pay for up to 50% of their future checks, right? Uh, so interesting program, really as a, as a set of mechanics for influencing behavior, it really wasn't working. And what we did was we redesigned their loyalty program into different membership levels. They still only had about 15% of people that moved into these paid memberships uh, where they were actually prepaying to get larger discounts on things and more, uh, let's say, benefits included and so on. But even at the lowest level, we improved the customer engagement by about 50%. Uh, and that 50% turned into 50, yeah, 50 more visits that they weren't getting from the, the old loyalty points. So it's there's a whole element of game dynamics that we can put into structured pricing systems that work a lot better than like the typical loyalty cashback models. Yeah, yeah. And there's got to be a, another way to do all of that as well. Give me an yeah. idea. And I don't know if you can give me the answer. You can say no if you don't have the answer. But if a shopping center was going to come to you, and I know you're based, you, you have offices around the world, but if you had uh, a shopping center from, say, um, Saudi or the UAE come to you and say, what are you going to charge me, Sentio, for a, a some kind of a strategy session that's going to carry on for a quarter, for instance, for three months, four months. Mm -hmm. What's the range? The range. Uh, I, good, good question. Okay. It, depends, it depends. It depends on the model that we choose. So if we if we were doing it as a facilitated strategy session, uh, they usually end up somewhere ten to fifteen thousand dollars for per day of the of the sessions that we do. Yeah. Um, okay. So they're not that they're not that bad. If we do consulting projects where we're doing a lot of work, then it depends on you know, yeah, the amount of Yeah, it goes up in value system. for you. So, your time yeah. is invested. Yeah. Okay. And then th there's another thing that's important. Um, we're, we're very focused on results. Um, and unlike most uh, consultants out there, we reveal our methodology and education programs. So <laughs> we, we believe in, yeah. Yeah, we believe in, the, in the transfer of knowledge and, and tools more than the transfer of paper. Um, and because we're so focused on actual results, we usually defer 30 to 50% of our compensation and tie it to the results of the performance. Project. Okay. That's yeah. Great. So those, those type of success fee engagements actually allow our team to get much more involved and it allows the, the client to understand that we have skin in the game as well. Yeah. So we're, you know, we're acting in, in everybody's best interest, not just delivering 300 pages of paper and saying, you know, good luck. Here's all the recommendations. It's more, more about getting things implemented and seeing the result. Well, I'm looking at the time. We have uh, some time left, but we have questions and answers, sure. uh, a session for that. So Leah or uh, Kay, uh, how are we for question and answer? Do we have any? Because if not, I have a number of other questions that I can certainly ask uh, Michael. We have from the attendees, um, I'll unmute now Mariam Alde. I see, okay. So um, the question, Michael, was, is an app in a shopping center a cost-effective vehicle, for example, over something like Instagram? And I don't know if you have the answer for that or some uh, thoughts on that. I do, and I think, uh, I think there's a, a mistake in the shopping center industry that's been going on for a couple of years now of using external providers to build the app. Uh, personally, I think every shopping center should be investing in a, a team that will build their own, their own app. That app is your ability to have dialogue with every single visitor to your center. Um, and doing that through in Instagram or Facebook or whatever else, it's a, a venue that you can't control as easily as your, your own app. So that app gives you the ability to Navigate, navigate the customer through your environment, to push messages to them, to ask them for feedback. It, it, in, in my opinion, if I owned a shopping center, which uh, I, I'm not sure I would be up for that investment, but <laughs> if I owned a shopping center, I would put a significant amount of, of energy, attention, and budget into developing that app as a, a key venue for dialogue with, with, with your customers. So I hope that, that answered your question, Mario. Any other questions, Leah? 
Um, next question will be coming from Umesh Agarwal. Umesh, hello. Hi. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, David and MESC, for organizing this. And uh, thank you, Michael. So far, it's been great. Oh, uh, uh, just a question from the point of view of, uh, of you being the consultant, consultant facilitator and all that. See, what happens is that uh, when we talk about uh, consultancy to a retailer or a brand or a, or a shopping center for that matter, or a developer for that matter, I mean, every consultant or, or, a, or a facilitator has a has an intellectual property on what he or she is trying to, you know, impart to those uh, people. But then there is always an overlap. So, I mean, the question is from a personal perspective that uh, I wanted to understand as to how do you differentiate yourself among so many, you know, clients and so many people doing the same thing. I mean, just a direct question. Like, how do how do you differentiate your business, or how do we differentiate our? How our... do you how do you differentiate from other uh, people in the same? Uh, yeah, you know? good yeah. good question. So I I, I grew up in uh, in Pricewaterhouse Coopers, which is a you know one of the big global consultancies, and they have a, a huge retail practice, a banking practice, telecom practice, and so yeah. on. And I had uh, two business lines that I was responsible for in PwC. One of them was, uh, was called large scale program and change management, which is basically business transformation. Uh, and the other one was called e-business advisory. That was 20 years ago. And now, it would, now that would be referred to as, e as digital transformation. Um, but in, and what's funny is I dug out a presentation from my e-business advisory days about a year ago. And I would say maybe 80, 85% of the content was exactly the same as what we say today. So <laughs> there, has, there hasn't been a lot of progress. You know, <laughs> people are still talking, oh, digital, yes, we should Absolutely. get rid of paper and signatures and so on. It's really interesting. But um, how we differentiate and why I left uh, PwC, PwC is a, a, a great uh, consultancy and all the consultancies have value that they create for their clients. Um, I was tired of the old consulting model, uh, the consulting model of we take your information, we repackage it in some black box somewhere and come back with, you know, 100 recommendations on 300 pages of presentation. And then we leave and good luck. Right. And, and that collects dust on a shelf somewhere. And I was tired of that model. And there was even a joke in PwC in those days that each centimeter of your of paper was worth 100,000 euros. And so people would walk by and say, well, how big is your report? You know, and they would measure it and so on. So that, that was kind of a, I, I, I thought the model was broken then. I believe even more today that that model of consulting is outdated and, and doesn't bring value for clients. And so I started developing when I left PwC and started Centeo. My whole idea was how do we reveal the methodology? How do we make sure that there's this transfer of knowledge and tools that goes to the client? And, and, and how do we guide that, you know, supporting the client through, through, the, through the implementation of things? And most of what we talk about, they're not one-off uh, engagements. These are new skill sets that need to be built into the organization. So if you have oh, something that needs to be done once, then the old consulting model works. But most of what we're talking about in customer experience, relationship management, loyalty, innovation, whatever, you need the skill set in the organization. Uh, they're not one-time activities. So our whole model is quite different than traditional consulting because we reveal the methodology, we educate people on it, we let them get their, their hands dirty, and that's, that's our model. There's a downside to it, which, which is every client's different and it's hard to standardize that, that type of uh, model because we effectively do the work differently with every single client. Um, so it's hard to scale, which is why we're a boutique consultancy and we've stayed that way because we have close client relationships where we're customizing everything for each client. There's a, an analogy that I give where I say, you know, if you, if you wanted to... Um, if you need, need to, if you need a cake, if you want to bake a cake, right? Um, if you're in your kitchen and you've never made a cake before and you're going to try it on your own, uh, you're probably going to have a lot of failed attempts before you get to something tasty and beautiful, right? <laughs> so Because you don't have the methodology, the experience and so on. Absolutely. So then you have two options. One of them is I can hire a chef that's going to bake a cake for me 
which is the, the one-time deal and I don't get any transfer of knowledge and so on. Or I hire a chef that's going to teach me how to bake a cake and stand there, stand there next to me and make sure I don't screw it up along the way. <laughs> so that's, that's the, the, the key differentiator. Thank you. That's very, that's a very good, very good. Thanks, Mesh. Yeah, thank you. Very good. Question. Any other questions, Leah? We now have Shasad Anwar on the floor. Hi, Shasad. Hello, how are you? Um, um, first of all, I want to thank the entire MSC team, especially David, for coming up with this amazing webinar once again. Um, it's quite a uh, you know, good way to learn from the industry leaders. So my question is basically from um, Sir David. And um, you know, I wanted to ask that you know, uh, in Pakistan, there's a lot of uh, you know, boom coming up for online shopping, and there's a lot of uh, new companies who are investing, like Alibaba uh, from China, um, in this business, and you know, they are doing uh, very well. So, what do you think um, that you know, as a mall management, should be considered to go um, uh, on the e-commerce uh, direction, or we have to do something? Um, as it is becoming, you know, a serious concern uh, for mall management to actually see that, um, you know, that how we can actually secure our share of wallet uh, from them. Uh, like I saw in COVID, uh, Mall of Dubai actually partnered with Noon.com and, um, you know, they started uh, their online business through Noon because they already have that um, business in place. Before time, so it is easy for them to actually shift the entire mall of Dubai over there. But for us, it is uh, difficult, and um, you know the major concern which comes out whenever we discuss is that if we actually come up with an online uh, solution for the customers, then it is definitely going to affect the the on ground uh, footfall for the mall. Yeah. And then you know we don't know that what is going to be um, uh, you know as a business is it viable or not. So this is something which I want to discuss is from you and Sir David if yeah. you know they can tell us and guide us what should be the very, line of action. Very very good question, and I think it, extremely relevant uh, coming out of a pandemic <laughs> because yeah. I mean w what happened over the last year and a half in terms of pushing everybody and getting everybody experienced with online purchasing. Um, there's a, a lot of things that I fear uh, won't go back to the way they were before. Uh, like for, for me, I can't imagine, uh, I, I just, I don't understand why for so many years I physically went to a supermarket and carried everything back to my house. I like, I can't, I can't, I don't, I don't understand why I did that for so long, you know? And I think a lot of the, this is going to push a change in retail and in shopping centers to have better hybrid uh, user experiences and user journeys, and also to have better hybrid type customer experiences and solution type journeys. So what I mentioned before about like Zara, uh, you know, if they had a, a solution package because I graduated and I need to build my first business wardrobe or something like that, or I want to, you know, I need a new seasonal uh, change to my wardrobe or whatever. If they built those things, they, they need to be online, offline. Uh, maybe I want to go into the store to, to touch everything, try it on and so on, but I don't want to carry stuff around. Uh, so I'll order it in the store and it'll be delivered through this kind of hybrid process. Or maybe I go to the store just to try stuff on and get to know the new collection. Uh, but then I go back home and online because I have a budget. Maybe I'm going to plan purchases over the next uh, three months from that collection uh, for that season. So, you know, maybe I'm splitting my purchases over time. And if they give me the functionality to plan my purchases and, and plan my budget for those purchases, then we're creating this hybrid experience, hybrid journey. Personally, I think that uh, the, the shopping centers themselves have to evolve more into community and experience spaces and maybe like try on centers and stuff like that. Uh, I think coming out of the, the pandemic that, that there's a lot of behavior. I still like going and shopping. I think most people still like going and shopping, but I sure don't like carrying stuff around afterwards. I'd much rather, <laughs> much rather have everything delivered. So, uh, yeah, I think further, you asked uh, my opinion on it as well. And, and I could mirror or echo what uh, Michael was saying. It, it, as we all know, the pandemic has accelerated all of these trends and grocery shopping is one of the biggest and, and the delivery and the service elements are the biggest elements. So 
if you're not engaged with your customer in the way you have to try and do a hybrid kind of a deal with them on the customer experience, I think you're going to lose out. So yes, 100%, you have to. Any other questions, uh, Leah? Yes, uh, we only have one uh, question uh, left before uh, we end the session. Uh, this is from Hussein Jamal. Um, he's asking, how can a mall lo loyalty or point scheme work when majority of the major retailers have their own loyalty apps and point scheme? Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Uh, I, I think, well, there's part of it that, that probably comes down to the agreements that are signed with the, with the retailers and maybe getting the retailers to have some point sharing or something like that. That's a, a long shot to get most of the big retailers to, to agree to stuff like that. I think uh, the mall loyalty and point scheme need to be about more than just uh, cash back or discounts or things like that. And it could even become a venue. If you're a mall and you have better dialogue uh, with your customers, you know when they come in because they're, they're pinged on a, a Wi-Fi beacon. Uh, you know they're in their space, so you can you can push to them. And you would actually be a much that that app is going to be a better venue for communicating with customers when they're in the space or when they're away from the space. Hey, you haven't been here for a while. Uh, this retailer is offering you a free lunch uh, or a free cup of coffee or whatever. Uh, it's a much better uh, venue for dialogue than the retailer's app where they they don't know where you are. They don't know if you're in the space or when the last time you were in the space in their space and so on. So I think there's there's a, a, a synergy that needs to be there. I would put functionality in the in the mall loyalty scheme, not just cash back and discounts, but more about this communications, this dialogue venue, and maybe having a system of different benefits like uh Maybe the mall has a delivery program, or maybe they people that are visiting often they're in loyalty points and they get priority parking, uh, or different things like that, where the the it's not necessarily about the cash back, but more about the benefits and the ease of using the space and staying in touch and having a, a community calendar, maybe having some uh, exclusive events for top users that could even be put into a series of tariff plans and membership models. Um, if we were able to use that loyalty program to get some type of subscription or membership model, then that customer is going to think twice before they go to another shopping center. Uh, because I know that here I get special treatment. I, I'm recognized. I, I have my checklist of things that I want to buy. Maybe I have budgeting tools. Maybe I've got a wish list uh, in there. Uh, there. There's a lot of opportunities. Yeah, I would think um, maybe I could add a little bit on that. You're sure. saying I know that you uh, in Muscat and you have a massive aquarium in your shopping center, which is a, a very big differentiator. And I would suggest that you could consider having something to do with the schools and students to identify fish types and environments where they live and and try and create something about what makes your shopping center different than others. And with the aquarium, for instance, and the ability to get schools to come and participate. And when those students come, then after the students come, then their parents bring them back to talk about what they learned. And then you also have, I think, a bit of a museum going on in that shopping center as well. And, and, and that is, in my view, would be an excellent way to differentiate. You're looking for differentiation, I think, of what I could characterize it as. So yeah. that's how I would add it. Good, good. At the beginning, we announced that there was a 10% discount on online courses. I actually think it's a 30% discount. Um, which is so, great. That's which a great, great benefit for everyone. And so, thank you, Michael so, and Centio, for doing that. That's great. No problem. No problem. So we, we have an, an online learning center with a number of courses uh, that you can speed it up or slow it down to, to, and listen to things over. Um, but basically, a lot of the stuff that we talked about today, we have in actual structured courses with video exercises, case studies, uh, and so on. And uh, there's a 30% a promo code for, for all the participants of today's webinar. So uh, I think Leah can send that to everybody afterwards. Sure, that's great. Michael, in wrapping up, is there anything that you'd like to uh, suggest to part with before we go? I, I would say it's a, it's a pleasure. I, I like I like this kind of conversation format much more than, than me too. I, it's great. Yeah, you can get yeah. to the detail that I like. Yeah, 
And uh, it's a, a pleasure to meet everybody. Great questions. Uh, so very, very good. Uh, I think hopefully we hit on a relevant topic. Yeah, and I'm looking forward to September, September the 15th for our next webinar. Yeah. And uh, it's more about the customer journey as well. And there are other elements that we can get into. So uh, anyway, I appreciate everybody for joining us today. It's been a wonderful experience. Michael Ruckman, thank you for uh, making your time available and for your generous 30% uh, uh, discount for your, your online courses. That's fantastic. I appreciate that very much. Uh, and for all of you out there, uh, our valuable MECSR, Middle East Council of Shopping Centers and Retailers members, thank you for uh, remaining with us. Uh, it's always been a pleasure and we're here to serve you and help you and for you to uh, succeed in your business, which uh, I think it's, it's part of what we do. I think the big thing for us is going to be in December 6th, 7th for our live session again at the Ritz-Carlton Hotel in Dubai. And we look forward to seeing you all then and uh, getting back together for a real live yeah. open air conversation again with people. So that's all I have to say again. And I want to thank everybody for joining us. Michael, thanks again. And thank Leah you. and the team, thank you. It's always a pleasure. You make it seem so simple to have all of this happen. And I, I thank you very much for making it so. Anyway, that's it for me. Thanks very much, everyone. And we'll talk again soon.